I offer my most humble pranams at the lotus feet of beloved Bhagwan, dearest Swami, respected elders and dear brothers and sisters. I just went down memory lane and it felt so beautiful because when when I think about Swami, the question that comes to me is where do I begin? There's that beautiful song, you know, I love that song. Where do I begin? to tell the story of how greater love can be the sweet love story that is older than the sea the simple truth about the love he brings to me where do i start where do i start because this love story that is there between us and swami between you and swami between me and swami between the devotee and the lord it it's older than the sea it spans several lifetimes we just know about this lifetime and that's why i thought possibly the best way to begin the story is from this lifetime as far as my memory goes even as a child i remember seeing swami's photograph in our altar and uh, he it was a small photograph a po possibly a pocket calendar and he was there in the altar and i would see him every day because uh, thanks to my parents i had this habit of praying every day my father would have kept a few flowers for me to place to the gods any gods we had many gods most indian homes will have multiple gods from venkateshwara to krishna rama shiva devis everyone we, everyone is welcome here you know so all gods and there amidst them also was swami's picture and i would keep flowers and therefore i used to see swami daily but i had no clue who he is who he was nothing when i was possibly 7 or 8 year old 1989 or 1990 1989 i think i just asked my dad very casually i asked father who is this because you know by then my mind had started developing possibly and i had become curious i knew that all the gods are either idols or paintings correct because which god is photographed no god is photographed all gods are either idols or paintings so amidst all these idols and paintings how come this photograph swami today i realize that such a great blessing it is the only avatar that has allowed himself to be photographed of course there are a couple of photographs of shirdi baba but other than that i don't think any avatar has been photographed right it's a great blessing a thing that we take for granted so often we don't realize how helpful it is in our sadhana in our progress in our growth that swami has allowed himself to be photographed so many ways you know this was the thing i never thought at that time that there can be a god in a photograph so i asked my dad who is he my father was a bit hesitant because he was wondering how will i accept it so he told me oh this is the person who did my thread ceremony so i thought that this must be some priest some very unique looking priest because priests are usually bald with only little bit of hair over here uh, this swami is having hair all over <laughs> but anyway uh, i thought he is some priest the next question that i asked my dad was if you are keeping this priest's photo in the altar why don't you keep the photo of the priest who conducted your wedding or who did my naming ceremony for all of that we call a priest right what is so unique about this priest and that was when my father told me that no no this is not a priest he is god and i accepted the beauty of childhood is that you accept whatever is told in faith see i never questioned how can a pot bellied and elephant faced being be god that is ganesha god yes ganesha god accepted how can a monkey faced muscular bodied being be god no that is hanuman god hanuman god done as simple as that childhood so beautiful and simple as adults we complicated as mark twain said i was uh, born wise education ruined me <laughs> so i think it's like that as we grow older we become complicated we make things so difficult complex but for me it was very simple oh this is god okay i accepted it that's it so when people ask me you know how did you believe swami how did what was your experience with swami i possibly narrate to them incidents of how swami saved my father from heart attack or his way of blessing my sister for her marriage which showed his omniscience 
or possibly different different incidents which are miraculous in the world's eyes but the fact of the matter is all those experiences happened after i had faith at that point in time i was firmly convinced that bhagwan is my bhagwan it is not as if these incidents happened and therefore i believed i believed just like i believed every other god oh swami is god my father said and i believed as simple as that but there is some beauty even in that simplicity on one hand this answer from my dad triggered in me respect and reverence that oh this is not some photograph this is also god so i started keeping a flower for him also after that you know <laughs> because only gods get flowers others don't get flowers and that is also very significant you know swami says the flower that we offer is the hridaya pushpam swami says the mano manofalam the fruit of the mind the deha patram the leaf of the body the hridaya pushpam or the flower of the heart and ananda bhashpam the water of tears of joy these are the offering we should make to god and it is so symbolic that we offer the flower to god and nothing else because our heart is worthy only god is worthy enough for our heart to be offered to nothing else in the world is worth that so anyway i began to keep a flower to swami in the meanwhile this question also triggered something in my father my father actually as a child not even a teenager a young boy of 11 or 12 he had had his darshan of swami swami had done his uh, thread ceremony that's a beautiful long story in itself swami had kept my father on his lap and whispered in his ear the gayatri mantra given him a mantra for him to use all his life so many beautiful things but after that i think possibly dad got busy with life got busy with living and circumstances in the family many things again cutting the long story short he had not visited swami at all after that for quite some years swami had just become a photograph in our altar but this question you know everything has a time place desha kala paristhiti as swami says this question triggered in him also an urge to hey let me go and see swami so he asked me do you want to go and see him my mother was the first to come and say yes ever since we have got married i have been asking you i want to see him you have not taken me i want to see i said yes father i want to see this god who is alive wow i want to see definitely my father also called up his elder sister and said hey we are all thinking of going to see swami do you want to come oh yes a whole family you know just everybody got excited yeah let's go let's go let's go but but where is swami is swami in puttaparthi is swami in brindavan back those days no internet no mobile phones it's very hard to imagine those days also in these days when everything is available at the click of a button it took my father almost one entire day to find out that satya sai baba was at brindavan we were living in bangalore and swami was at brindavan so my father said come let's go for darshan so on his motor bike the four of us father mother me and my sister me sitting on the tank of the motor bike on the fuel tank we traveled back in those days bangalore didn't have any traffic it was a breeze we got to brindavan in 20 minutes and honestly speaking you know my first darshan oh my goodness just took my breath away <laughs> i wish i can say that because none of that happened in fact i don't even recollect how my first darshan was you know i just don't know i i have a memory of how the because you know after that every thursday sunday thursday sunday thursday sunday continuously for about 6 7 weeks as long as swami was in bangalore Uh, in fact that year 1990 there was even a summer course and i attended even the summer course so every thursday sunday we would go for darshan so i have a recollection of how the darshans were during that time but honestly i am blank when i think of what was the first darshan because i have tried thinking of it because it it didn't have that effect on me i just went and sat i remember we were sitting under the tree sairam shed in brindavan Swami came walking. He walked around. Bhajans were going on. I saw Swami, and yeah, I, I just, I think more than me feeling love, reverence, and faith, I was uh, possibly induced with the love, reverence, and faith that my parents had. See, this is the most important role that parents play. 
parents have been given the great responsibility to grow up children and we have rights over or rights or we have control over the first 10 15 years how we would like to shape them it's so important that we teach them the most important and eternal things of life rather than all other things rather than baba black sheep let us teach them baba satya sai huh? so because that is what happened as i remember that as i walked out though i don't remember what was my first darshan i remember that after the first darshan as we walked out of brindavan i told my father please buy me that ring i want i wanted to wear swami as a uh, on my ring finger that is the importance of parents exuding the love because you know many times people ask uh, you know how do we impart this faith and devotion to our children i don't think we can impart it devotion and faith swami only has to give but i think when they see what their parents love regard and revere and respect some impact will definitely be there many times it so happens that we want our children to chant the mantras the shlokas attend bhajans and be moral learn ethics but we ourselves feel that hey, we don't have time we know all this we don't have time for it we ourselves don't know the mahabharata we ourselves don't know the ramayana we ourselves don't know our scriptures or swami's teachings uh, how will it happen it will not in this way i was lucky because such love faith my parents exuded that i came back home and in those early darshan days i emptied a bookshelf in my parents cupboard in my parents uh, room and made it my altar not not the general every home will have an altar not this altar i had my own personal altar because in my personal altar the whole plethora of gods were not there it was only swami one photograph of swami agarbatti and uh, i would light agarbatti and keep photos here uh, keep flowers here to this photo see that is the kind of impact that faith can have and the parents uh, love feeling and devotion can have so i began to worship swami as my god and as i worshiped swami i began to develop affinity towards him you know it came like that it was not love at first sight it was not uh, Uh, wow like nothing as i said but i definitely know that within the first month itself i might have had about four or five darshans as i said every thursday every sunday within that time some love came i began to like this thing i would i would see that swami is throwing chocolates and i asked my parents one day let me also hold chocolates and and i had complete faith this is god you know if at all i want to like nobody on earth has seen god i am able to see god and i can check out ex- exactly how god is like i used to think possibly there's only the head and there's nothing inside this was one theory in my head the child head you know like so swami possibly nothing there's nothing inside so what i actually did also was when i had those chocolate uh, chocolates for swami to throw we would offer it in a tray and swami would take and throw it i touched his stomach actually just to check if there's anything inside or you know it's only <laughs> air nothing because and then i felt something solid and i told my uh, parents that you know swami has got a very strong abdomen it's very stiff i didn't realize it's only in retrospect now that i feel that possibly i touched the knot of his dhoti you know because inside the robe swami would wear a dhoti so that dhoti would have a, a knot there and possibly i touched that knot and i felt oh i don't know what swami would have felt because i was not looking at him as he took the chocolate i touched and i saw and i felt that wow swami is having such strong abdomen but it was so beautiful to have a personal god you can uh i i saw that people are giving letters and i also felt i also want to write a letter i didn't know it's a letter what it is because you know imagine at age 8 i had never possibly written a letter to many people one or two letters maybe i had written so what is it they're giving papers to swami oh you can write how do i write and that's when you know i wrote dear dear what should i write dear yeah he had already become dear i started dear swami and i began to write letters every thursday every sunday i would write not that he would take every time but it's okay i would just try when he would take so it it grew like that what i'm trying to tell here is that it is something that is cultivated many people say that you know we want to have devotion for god but i don't feel anything if we don't feel anything just keep doing by practice it becomes muscle memory by practice power practice is so powerful in the mahabharata it is said that uh, 
uh, sage drona acharya drona who was the teacher for the kauravas and pandavas he favored his own son ashwatthama so every night he would take extra classes for ashwatthama because he wanted his son to be the best that kind of uh, vatsalyam he had that attachment he had in the end that attachment was the cause for his downfall every attachment causes downfall we don't realize it for drona also it happened i won't go into that story but the point is he feared that arjuna will do better than my son ashwatthama so what he told the cooks he called the cooks and told them that ensure that you serve food for arjuna before the sun sets what is the connection the connection is instead of telling the connection let me tell you what happened one day arjuna's dinner got late so therefore he was eating in the night when he was eating in the night a gust of wind switched off the lamp in whose light he was eating food it was pitch dark and arjuna continued to eat and being that very sharp razor sharp intellect a thought occurred to him hey it is pitch dark i can't see anything yet how am i able to eat how is my hand knowing where to put the food if you observe babies when they are learning to eat they will put it all over their face even inside their clothes they miss their mouth not by millimeters they miss it by even inches they put it into their ear nose everywhere but very soon they are able to put it in their mouth we take it for granted we don't understand how unconsciously even in pitch dark we can eat food and arjuna thought oh this is because all my life i have been eating i know it so anything if i do in the dark i can learn and that is how arjuna became a shabdavedi shabdavedi means he can hear a sound and shoot an arrow because he began to practice in the dark and that was a special skill that Ar uh, drona had taught only ashwatthama he didn't want arjuna to learn that and that's why he had told all this but arjuna mastered it so anything we repeatedly do we become in fact there is a famous a uh, quote which goes i am what i repeatedly do that is why it is so important to examine what we are doing repeatedly whatever we do repeatedly we become that and by repeatedly just worshiping swami and putting flowers simple thing you know it's not some great spiritual activity every morning get up put flowers light agarbatti but just doing that over two months i was in love with swami i was convinced this is divinity and i was convinced that this is the best god because later on even in the altar all the other gods please to the right or to the left center is swami <laughs> even in the main altar swami became center that was very symbolic of the position he had occupied in my heart and in all our hearts in the family he became the central deity and that is why just continue all these things that we are taught we think they are rituals no they cultivate something in us they they build it within us they are not mere rituals they when we understand the spirit behind it the spirit behind the ritual will make it spiritual and that's how i got love for swami and uh, that's it after that swami went off to puttaparthi and, uh, and by now we also wanted to have darshan more so i think i made my first visit to parthi again i recollect going to parthi i recollect where we stayed but i don't have recollection of the first darshan in parthi also but i have good feelings about it Hmm? that is why it is so important you know we note down all these experiences back then i used to not note down i started noting down only from 1998 onwards 6 7 years later but you know memory changes it fades that's why anything related to swami write it down record it because this is the only important thing in our life everything else you can forget no problem so parthi went came and within an year after that my father got transferred to bombay we had to shift to bombay and when i went to bombay that was the first time i experienced the omnipresence and omnipotence of swami how it happened was uh, one night swami came in my dream my first ever dream of swami that i recollect maybe i got before that but i don't know in that dream what happened was swami was walking with my mother and i was walking behind swami suddenly swami turns around and holds my right wrist so firmly that it aches it pains it's so realistic that when i woke up also my wrist felt little painful and he releases my wrist and says go now it's fine so i got up and went to my mom and said mom swami had come in my dream and he hurt me my mother asked for an explanation i gave her the explanation i said this is what happened 
Then she said, no, no, very good. Swami came in your dream and it is something nice. I was like, how can it be something nice? It, he held, I don't know why he held. Left it at that. Now, the altar that I had made for myself in Bangalore, that altar had shifted also to uh, Bombay. And now in the altar was a photograph that I had myself clicked. Ah, that is one more beautiful story. Uh, see, so much love I felt for Swami that in 1990, I went to my dad and said, Dad, my birthday, you know, this year, I don't want a birthday party. I don't want gifts. I don't want anything. Like how you are clicking Swami's photo, I also want to click Swami's photo. This is what I told my father. A very strange request from an eight-year-old. And back in those days, cameras were expensive. And yet, my father bought me one point-and-shoot camera, small camera, 35mm, Kodak or Yashika, Yashika camera. He bought it for me and he said, yeah, this is what you wanted. So, uh, we went to Brindavan for darshan and I was sitting there under the tree, Sairam shed. The gate opened and Swami walked out. This is 1990. And as Swami walked out, I got up on my knee, clicked the photograph. Then somebody said, Sairam, sit down. So, I sat down. After a minute, I again, I got up, clicked one photograph. Every minute, I clicked one, 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 one. And Swami was like a speck, orange speck, because so far away, it is 35mm, no zoom, no lens, nothing. Just point and shoot camera with a film roll. And every time you click, it is heard for almost two meters around, you know. Uh, because grrr, grrr, that whirring sound of the camera. And then Swami, during the entire darshan, I kept clicking. And in out of those 36 photographs, uh, in a film roll, there would be 36 exposures possible. If you were lucky, you would get 37. Out of the 36, only one came nicely. Close by, Swami collecting letters, not looking directly at the camera. But that photo was so nice and my father, I felt very happy when I saw that my father had got it developed and framed and that was now the photo in my altar in Bombay. That was so beautiful. Speaking of the camera again, after that, I began to enjoy clicking Swami's photographs and uh, later on when I joined Swami's school, I felt I need a better, better camera and I used to see who, what my friends are having or others are having and call and tell father, buy this camera for me. One thing that has that has struck with me is, you know, my father wanted to, uh, every time when I ask him, dad, this camera, my dad says, hey, Arvind, you know, listen, I want to buy you one camera. I tell dad, dad, no, no, dad, listen, I want this camera. I like it. My dad will tell, you know, I let just consider, I'll, no, 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 dad, please, please, please. If you love me, buy this camera for me. So my dad will say, okay. And he'll, he bought it for me. He bought one more camera with a small zoom. And you know, when clicking with that, after I joined Swami school, of course, that's a big story that I will I will share very soon now. But uh, that camera, when I was clicking with that, I felt that it's not good enough. So I asked for another camera. I kept asking. Finally, once my father said, you know, Arvind, you be quiet. I'm going to get you on camera. You just be quiet. And he got me a Nikon SLR camera with a lens. This was something I never imagined because who gives a teenager a camera like that? Very, very expensive. See, again, this is something that the new generation or even us, we cannot appreciate it because we have got so used to cameras being ubiquitous. Everywhere there's a camera. The laptop has a camera, the phone has a camera, the camera has a camera, the TV has a camera, the house has a camera, cameras are everywhere, camera has a camera, you know. But cameras were very rare to come by back those days and such a stupendous camera, very expensive. I couldn't believe it. I said, Dad, this is your camera. My dad said, no, no, not mine. It is similar to mine. It's more advanced than mine. It's a new one. I said, you bought this for me. Oh my God. How, how are you like, how are you entrusting me with it? No, no, click. You want to click, Swami? No, you click. I said, Dad, what is this soup? I, I never imagined. And my dad said, this is what I wanted to get you last year itself. But you were so adamant on your camera. I thought, then I realized how stupid, how foolish, you know, I was. I'm asking for all these small, small things and my dad has planned something great. Now, this is the case with my worldly father. What about our heavenly father? You know, dear brothers and sisters, I feel many times we are so foolish in asking Swami for things. Why to ask? What he, if, if the worldly father can plan something so magnificent and so unimaginable, how much our divine father will be planning for us? In retrospect, when this struck me, I decided and even to this day, 
I never ask Swami anything. Because I know that whatever I ask Swami is definitely going to be far less than what he has already decided to give me. Because his love for me is far greater than what I understand his love for me to be. That's why I don't want to ask at all. <laughs> this was something that happened and triggered off with that camera. But anyway, this photo was there in my altar. And now in Bombay, real estate is very expensive. Homes are costly. Rents are very high. Uh, therefore, <clears throat> it was a smaller home. And I didn't have the luxury of an entire shelf for myself as an altar. And therefore, you know, uh, we in India call it as a pelmet. Basically, it's a kind of a wooden structure on which we put the uh, curtain rods. And you know, on the curtain rod, the curtain goes. So to cover the curtain rod on top, there'll be a small wooden frame like thing. We call it a pelmet. And on the top of that pelmet was my altar. On top, there was a little space. So there was this photo of Swami. There was one Shivalinga, there was one small Ganesha, one Krishna and one Agarbatti, Agarbatti stand. And every morning, I would climb onto a, a chair, climb onto a, a, a desk, and on top of the desk is another stool. I will climb onto that, stand and do my puja, and then get down. This was my daily schedule. So that morning, I got up, got onto the chair, got onto the table, got onto the stool, and I'm doing all my puja. Unknown to me, my sister, for something else, took the chair. It was a chair with wheels. So she just rolled it and took it off. I didn't even know. And so after finishing the whole thing, when I put my leg back, there was nothing. I stepped into thin air with full confidence that the chair is there and crash. I crashed to the ground and I fell onto my right wrist and it was paining like crazy. Immediately I was rushed to the doctor and the doctor took an X-ray. And he said, you're very lucky. You've just been saved from a fracture. There's nothing to worry about. And then my mother said, see your win. That is why Swami held your hand in your dream. You remember? Because he wanted to prevent this fracture. See, this is what it is. And I believed it. I accepted it. At that point in time, we had not read, not read the discourse where Swami says, Swami coming in your dream is true. Uh, back then, Swami had not stated that in his discourse as well. It was after I joined as a student that Swami stated this, that Swami coming in your dream is as good as Swami visiting you in physical. But then my mother said, this is what it is. And I believed and I was, wow, man, this God is so powerful. Sitting so far away, he can reach me here. I don't have to go to Puttavarthi. I don't have to go anywhere. I can just be here because he's here. He's protecting me. Wow. That was a thrilling uh, uh, realization for me and then a few days later I had another dream now in this dream very nice dream very happy dream for any uh, child because Swami came and told tomorrow don't go to school and I was very happy I said okay Swami so I got up and went to my mom and said mom Swami came in my dream oh, what happened Swami told not to go to school hey you're lying no mom really Swami told me not to go to school she felt that I'm 100% lying because but then I said no mom really he said, okay, fine, stay back home. So I stayed back home. And that day, I got fever within a couple of hours. And that fever became more severe. And by the end of the day, I was diagnosed with chicken pox. Chicken pox is very infectious, viral uh, it is. Uh, very infectious and wow, my mother said, see, that is why, Swami said, because if you had gone to school, you would have been in trouble. Not only that, you would have spread this to everybody around also there. So... That is why, you know, and she told me the significance of my dream like that. So on one hand, I was like, wow, yeah, really, man, sitting there, Swami knows everything he's got. That happened on one side. On the other side, the questioning part, you know, the, the Jnana Yoga part, maybe the Jnana Marga, very basic. I began to wonder if Swami knows I'm going to get chicken pox. Swami knows that I'm going to fall and he's preventing. Why did he allow me to fall? <laughs> First of all, why did he allow me to get chicken pox? So these questions started. You know, and I think this is so beautiful because in life, there might be wrong answers, but there is never a wrong question. It is questions only. It is a Atma Vichara. It is self. We have to question. Everyone, nobody can eat on our behalf. Nobody can discover the path on our behalf. How many of our satsangs we attend, how many of our bhajans we attend, how much of our seva we do. It is an inner uh, investigation that should happen for us to get our answers and be convinced about it. 
So I am grateful to Swami because it began right then. I clearly remember me thinking, if Swami could do this much, why did he allow me to get chicken pox? Why can't he prevent? So much has happened after that, but that was the beginning. These are the seeds that are planted. And Swami is in no hurry. He has waited for us for generations, for multiple lifetimes. No problem. I'll plant the seed. If it sprouts after five years, let it sprout after five years. No problem. See, I told you my father, when he was 12 years old, he had come to Swami. After that, for almost a decade, out of touch with Swami. Swami didn't worry. No problem. <laughs> you will come. If not this birth, next birth. I'm happy it happened in this birth so that I could also get this chance. But that's what it is. So there's nothing to worry. Somebody is not coming to Swami. Somebody is going away from Swami. No problem. Let us hold on. Let us try. And everything will come. So this, this kind of questioning thing started. And I joined Balvikas in Bombay. After joining Balvikas, we learned the shlokas, got to know more about Swami, got to read about this. And that is when I got to know about this extraordinary breed of creatures called the students. Wow! Everybody when they speak of student, no? Oh, student, Swami student, Swami. What is this Swami student? In fact, I remember one auntie, her, her daughter got admission in primary school for first standard. She was on the phone. Huh? Sairam? Oh! Is it? Sairam! 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 I'm like, what happened? I'd never seen her in that kind of mad ecstasy. She kept it down. Sairam Hamara! Sairam Hamara! She started spontaneously singing bhajans. I thought she went nuts or what? What happened? What is that? Crazy! Then somebody told me, my mother told me, no, no, her daughter, no, she's got admission in first standard. Where? So what? Everybody studies first standard, right? No, no, in Swami school. Oh, so? Like, I wanted to join Swami school, not because of anything else, but I just felt, my God, what is this, yaar? People are going into raptures just because they got admission. What is this place? I told her, yeah, yeah, I also want to, I also want to join Swami school. So we started preparing, you know, uh, how started making enquiries. By then I had also visited Parthi once or twice. And now that I was sensitized to the Sai students, I used to observe this, you know, during Darshan, we'll all be sitting from before we'll be waiting because Swami has to come. And then suddenly in the last minute, one herd of white buffaloes, you know, literally they'll come in, they'll come rushing into the hall like that and sit all in the front. And then Swami will come for Darshan. And he'll talk to them only. I was like, Swami, they, they are sitting in front. They didn't come first. We have been here from long time. They came last minute. You know, literally. I understand why Swami calls students as Dunnapota. Because it used to really look like that. If you watch videos of the Serengeti, Serengeti plains, where these wild buffaloes run in their migration, right? Literally like that. The, just that white dress, white dress buffaloes. That's all. That even strengthened in me that desire. No, no, I also want to be a part of this herd. I also want to be Swami's Dunnapota. So that's why I uh, tried, you know, I wanted to join. I was in uh, seventh grade back then. And I thought, let me join primary school. My sister also, both of us. My sister was absorbed. I was not given a seat. And I was so disappointed. And already this little bit of ego, you know, had already started coming. I had told every friend of mine in Bombay, you know what, I'm not going to come back to Bombay here. I'm going to go to the best school in the world. It's an amazing, all that I had told. So all the goodbyes, farewells and all had been done with my friends. Now I felt so foolish to again go back and tell, hey, I didn't get admission, so I came back here. So, so I told my parents, no, I don't want to come to Bombay. Not because of anything else. It was not, uh, you know, it for a third person and even possibly for my parents, it appeared like my love for Swami, my determination to be with Swami. But I'm confessing here, it was just my fear. How will I face my friends? Peer pressure. Many times this happened. That's why, you know, I think we need to be extra sensitive even with children. Uh, they, their behaviors, they may say that this is the cause for the behavior, but there's some other cause for the behavior. For me, I didn't want to return to Bombay because how can I see my friends? I've already told them I'm not going to come. I'm going to go to the best place. And now uh, I didn't I didn't qualify for the best place. So I told my mother and father that no, I don't want to come to Bombay. I don't want to. They were like, oh God, look at his love for Swami. So they said, we'll go. We, they found out in Kerala, uh, Koilandi, Koikod, Calicut is a place. And there, Koilandi, there's one uh, school called Sri Satisai Vidya Peet Sri Shailam. I said, you go there. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll go. I'll join any Swami school. I'll join. And the principal in Swami school in Puttaparthi had told that, 
uh, you try again later on for 11th grade and if you are coming from another Swami school, you will get preference and priority. That is what was told to me. So I said, yeah, yeah Swami school only, you know, let me join. <laughs> I just joined and after that life got very, very tough. You see, like most of Swami schools uh, or the schools run in Swami's name, this school was subsidizing education and you know, back then in Swami's physical presence, oh, vibrant, all very, very great personalities, eminent personalities were involved in the education mission, you know, and therefore these schools used to produce very good results. And so a lot of people came there, not because they're devoted to Swami, but because it was highly subsidized and the education was good. And that became a problem for me. I was a part of a minority, a microscopic minority of Swami believers. Nobody believed in Swami, in Sri Sathya Sai Vidya Peet, Sri Shailam. But every morning we have prayers, before din lunch, dinner, breakfast, we have Brahmarpanam, food prayer, night prayer, bhajan, suprabhatam. And this would get on to the nerves of all the majority of the students. Because as I said, they were non-devotees. You know, I even use this term with a, with a aerial coat like this because some of those uh, boys who are now men, my seniors, my classmates, my juniors, who are non-devotees, who used to tease me, you know, that is one thing, they used to tease about Swami. Because Swami became like a weak point. They will abuse Swami. And in return, I used to abuse back their parents. <laughs> yeah, because, because for me, it was like, you see, Swami is my dear one. He is dear to me like my parents. So, for you to feel the pain that I am feeling, I need to abuse your parents. And they would get very angry. How dare you talk about a parent? Don't go to the parents, you know. I am telling you, don't go to Swami. Yes, go to Swami, some Swami. What the hell? How can you talk about my parents? They would not understand and this used to become fight. It used to lead to fist fights. I have had broken noses. I have had injuries because of these fights. I used to like, I have to fight for Swami. Swami doesn't need all that. Of course, now I have different ways of uh, dealing with people who criticize, people who are critical. Depending on how they criticize, there are different strategies that Swami has only uh, taught and I have learnt. But back then, I used to just fight. And as I said, I use this term uh, non-devotees in aerial quotes because many of them today are staunch believers of Bhagwan and their love for Swami is so immense. And they feel, they also feel, uh, remember those days and feel bad how it was like that. But back then, it was a struggle in Sri Shailam for me. The prayer hall in Sri Shailam didn't have doors, didn't have windows. It was fully open. And I feel this is very symbolic of how God's home is. It's open for all, closed for none and open throughout the day. Anytime God is always waiting. God is waiting for the devotee. Any place of God that does otherwise is not a place of God because God's place is open for all at all times. And I used to go in the night after dinner instead of going to bed, I would walk, walk up the steps of the prayer hall and then the whole prayer hall, there's one big photo of Swami in the front on the dais. I would climb up the dais. People were allowed to climb the dais only to give Aarti. But there's nobody here. It's 9.30 or 10 p.m. at night. I would climb up the dais, go and sit. Sit in front of Swami's photo and cry. I would cry and cry and tell, Swami, you didn't give me admission in your school. You brought me to Sri Shailam. Why, Swami? Swami, nobody here believes in you. They criticize you. I feel so bad. Why did I join this school? I would cry and cry and cry. And after crying, I will feel little good. Go back. And yeah, life would go on another week or 10 days. And again, when it is no longer, I'm not able to bear, I would walk in and I would cry. It is so beautiful to cry for Swami. It's so relieving. It is so uplifting. It's so enlightening. It's so beautiful. It's very nice. May we shed tears only for Swami. Two years passed like this. I was in 8th grade. And uh, for the first time, I participated in a elocution competition. It was a Hindi elocution competition. And I won it. <laughs> you know, I, I was not an orator. Nothing. It's just that I had learned the whole speech by heart. With every pause, everything. I had practiced it so well. See, that is why it is said practice makes a man perfect. And I had won the first prize in Hindi elocution. And because of that, I was asked that year, see for Onam, 
our school has got the opportunity to perform put up a small program in front of swami part of that is also a speech would you like to deliver a hindi speech in bhagwan's presence they thought that i am a master i am a pro in hindi even to this day when i make some hindi videos i struggle i prepare a lot i need to prepare you know prepare a lot to make hindi videos that's why the frequency of hindi videos are so less <laughs> but then they thought that i am really so good in hindi so they said can you and i was like yes swami is present in front of swami i'll get to speak yes yes uh, if why hindi <laughs> like in my mind i was like even if it's french i will speak because it's about committing it to memory i will just memorize it and yes i will speak so this was my josh this was my joy and they said yes so this onam arvind you will be giving a 6 minute speech in hindi yes so i went to my hindi teacher and asked her could you write a speech for me and she wrote down the speech and that's it i committed it to memory and i would practice it every day and every night so much i would practice in fact you just had to wake me up from sleep and say om shri sai ram and i would just rest will come off it's by default like breathing i knew my speech that's how well i had memorized it and the other agenda i had when i uh, got this chance was when i go to swami i wanted to tell swami please take me out of shri shalam please give me an admission in your school because i can't stay here swami i can't stay here that was my plan so that year 1995 onam we all <clears throat> as soon as uh, onam holidays were declared onam is a very big festival in kerala for the malayali people and uh, it comes somewhere in september so when the holidays were declared i immediately rushed my parent my mother came picked me up we went to puttaparthi few days later it is a 10 day vacation and for 3 days shri shri shalam would come to puttaparthi that is when they would put up the program as well for onam i went off early so that i can have extra darshans my mother had come and uh, one day i remember during darshan i was reading a book on the stories of krishna it was called the babe of brindavan and along with that always i would carry my speech copy because you know back then we didn't have uh, printouts printers were not common we didn't have a pdf nothing we had i had to i had written down my speech because hindi typing hindi text also we didn't have fonts it wasn't easy so i had written down my whole speech and i used to carry it everywhere that day when swami came i was in the first line so i thought i'll i'll show my speech to swami that was my intention so i got up and since the paper was so frayed and old because of use i kept it on top of the book and i showed it to swami like that and swami picked the book and letter from my hand and walked away after walking a little distance he stopped he turned around smiled gave back the book to me and turned and walked he took away my speech copy no problem because i came back and immediately i told my mother that this is what happened and immediately i wrote down the speech again i had it whole thing memorized right so i wrote it a few days later all my other friends and everyone friends and not friends because you know this also was an important thing because uh, my uh, stature as a devotee was going to be tested now because as i said majority were non devotees very few devotees were there who would face constant uh, trials and tribulation teasing and mockery by the non devotees because they would tease for me they would say he is a magician he is this pc sarkar is greater god for me all this purposely not that they believed in pc sarkar one magician to be a god but they just wanted to put swami down and make make us feel bad and this was like a weak point for us you know they used to criticize so so now this was like a redeeming thing like i had to uh, so that's why as i said i wanted to get out so they all came and that time on onam day i was seated on the dais right next to not right next to quite a distance away from swami's discourse table swami came completed his darshan round he came walking everywhere and then sat and the uh, Uh, swami was sitting there the darshan music was going on and on and on and swami was there sitting at the discourse table after a while one elderly person spoke and after he spoke swami asked for the boys to chant vedam vedam was chanted and then to my shock and horror swami got up and started the divine discourse all like swami my speech my speech my speech what about my speech and i was thinking you know maybe after swami's discourse i'll get a chance to speak 
<laughs> I had no clue of the things, right? I was hoping this is called hope. So I have no recollection of what Swami spoke because usually, as I said, I had also attended summer course. So I used to pay attention to what Swami is saying. Nothing. I was just waiting for my chance, kept practicing my speech. But no, that was not to be. Swami completed his discourse, received Arati, left. I was simply shattered. I was just shattered. So much I had prepared and Swami didn't give me a chance. I was so distraught, I went to my mother crying. Amma, what is this? Then my mother said, don't worry, Swami took your speech. No, Swami has already seen your speech. I said, then he should not have taken it. Give it back. I wanted to deliver it. Why did he take it then? Oh God, I didn't. But something my mother consoled me, I felt okay. After the vacation, when I returned back to school, oh my goodness, it was terrible. The teasing, the mockery went up several notches because, you know, they would say, look at this, he's a devotee, it seems. Swami also don't want to listen to him. Big devotee. Uh, junk, he must be a terrible fellow. Junk fellow he must be. That's why, you know, Swami didn't care. And like this, you know, now, now my visits to the prayer hall became even more frequent. I would cry, Swami, why did you do this to me, Swami? Why, Swami, why? I would cry. But then I felt the only way I can redeem myself, you know, I have to prove that I'm a devotee of God. <laughs> Actually, all these are makings of our own ego, but these are all lessons we learn. Like whom do I have to prove that I'm a devotee? Swami knows my devotion, right? No, but I felt the need. I have to prove, I have to prove to the world. I have to prove to my classmates that I'm a devotee of Swami and Swami loves me. How will that be possible? Next year, next year when Onam comes, again, our school will get a chance. I should give a talk. So because of that, for the first time in my life, I began to participate in dramatics, elocution competitions, because I had to win, right? When you win only, they will. It didn't happen in ninth grade because ninth grade, uh, when uh, it was chance to go to Puttaparthi, the chance was given to the girls. One year boys, one year girls. That was the understanding. So I didn't get. So even in 10th grade, I participated. And today when I look back, I think I won about 32 to 33 certificates for various things from singing to sports to elocution to dramatics to I participated in everything and struggled and excelled in everything. <laughs> when I look back at it, just that one rejection from Swami resulted in so many of my skills and abilities. I had, I had never given a speech <laughs> and I became an elocution champion. I became known as an orator. All of this because I want to make sure that I get to Swami. Today, when I look back, I feel so grateful to Swami. I feel so grateful to Swami and I feel, you know, dear brothers and sisters, there'll be difficult times in our life. But I promise you, if we hold on to Swami and calm ourselves, a time will come when we will shed tears and express gratitude to Swami for those very difficulties. Because He loves us so much. He won't... He won't give us difficulties because he enjoys putting us in trouble. He gives us these things so that we grow stronger. I'm reminded of a story of how God goes in a man's dream and tells him, can you do something for me? And the man says, yes, God, anything you want, I'll do. God says, tomorrow morning outside your house, there'll be a boulder. Can you just push that boulder? He says, yeah, I'll push it, God. He gets up and starts pushing. He pushes for the whole day, but that damn rock doesn't move even one inch. But this man doesn't give up. Next day, for weeks, he keeps pushing, pushing, pushing. That rock doesn't move. So much so that the devil comes and tells this man, why are you pushing so much? Just take it easy. This God has given you some Herculean task which you can't complete. Don't push. But luckily, this man had the sense to just check back with God. So he goes to God and says, God, what is this? This is so unfair. What is unfair? You told me to push the rock. And I've been pushing. It's not moving. But what did I tell you? To push the rock. Exactly. My dear one, I want you to push the rock. I don't want you to move it. I want you to just push it. Don't move it. Because I can move it. See, look. And God just moves the rock. I can move it like this. I didn't want you to move the rock. I wanted you to push the rock. You know why? Look at your biceps. How strong they are. Look at your triceps. Look at your calf muscles. Look at your abdominal muscles. How strong you have become. I feel so happy, my dear child. 
it is for this i told you to push the rock not to move it when we get responsibilities possibly in swami's organization in seva in bhakti we wonder oh god swami how much i am doing these people don't listen it's useless people are splitting people are doing all these things politics terrible things yes but swami told us to do sadhana for our growth we are doing seva for our growth we are participating in satsang for ourselves not for building organizations or empires that happen that swami will do he can build it we just have to make ourselves available to swami and do what he tells us that's enough karmanye vadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana not on the results of what we do our focus should be on our efforts and ensuring that those efforts are perfect and in 10th standard when onam time came everybody there was no doubts in anybody's mind speech means arvind arvind has to give the speech what was a lucky chance became my right kind of and by now though the number of non devotees remained the same they wouldn't tease because now they had respect for oh, this guy is a very good guy man better you know i also learned how to speak by then talk back reply back all these things all the beautiful traits for which i am so grateful to swami all of them got inculcated during the hardest phases in my life finally this this uh, crucial moment 10th grade onam time same deja vu sitting on the stage there this time you know i went to parthi earlier like before but i didn't show swami my speech <laughs> i didn't want him to take my speech because he'll take and again cancel my speech means so i didn't want all that to happen i didn't offer the speech nothing i did and on onam day i was sitting on the stage same thing swami came walking this is 1997 2 years later swami came walking this time my speech was in english and he sat at the discourse table and i remember two years back swami had turned to his right and called one elderly gentleman who had given the speech swami again turned to the right this time he looked at me and he said come <sighs> that excitement that i felt that energy that coursed through me my god this moment had come not only had i practiced my speech so much i had even practiced what i was going to ask swami when if and when swami calls and that was swami give me admission in your school give me admission in your school this prayer that i had repeated for nights and days in school had solidified it crystallized itself and i was sure this is what i'm going to ask now swami sitting there i'm going to go and ask him swami give me admission in your school even before i deliver my speech swami you promise me this this is what i wanted i went close to swami and touched his feet looked at swami and said swami and then swami swami had actually turned away when i said swami he turned ha huh? yes oh, the love the you know as i said the first darshan i didn't feel this time what i felt i had seen swami from this close before also but nobody else around exclusively mine and swami is all attention that one moment where he is making you feel that he has come for you alone looked and said yes what what do you want he didn't ask what do you want but yeah what dear brothers and sisters uncles and aunts i i don't know what happened in that moment but i'm grateful to swami for that i didn't ask for my admission at all i said swami all my life please keep me with you swami <laughs> this is something that i had not practiced but i think that was the call of the heart and i am so grateful that swami silenced the mind so that the voice of the heart could emerge because i don't think i could have asked for anything else better swami whatever happens please keep me always with you that is what i asked swami instead of asking for admission and swami said yes definitely definitely he promised that he would wow you know i i get very overwhelmed whenever i think of this because this was as i said not something that i had planned but swami knows what is good swami knows what is right swami knows swami knows what is our innermost desire the desire of that soul that pining heart that wants swami 
and therefore he does automatically that's why there's no need to ask as i said my father thought of the best camera to give me <laughs> swami knows the best boon to give me and so it was that i went and i delivered my speech that was less like a blur the whole thing was memorized it was by heart and from the heart i just delivered it two times there was some applause as well and at the end as i completed the speech i could see my brothers from shri shailam no longer am i calling them friends i am calling them brothers because the touch with swami that is what happens all my animosity towards them had just gone when we taste that divine love right all the hate vaporizes all the jealousy is gone you be we become so large hearted it's so beautiful that love and that is why we should yearn for that love because once we receive that love once we are able to experience that love all other problems just vanish no hatred no jealousy no anger nothing so beautiful that state is so beautiful that state is that when i you know when i had asked swami that always keep me with you now i know that it is the most beautiful prayer to make but back then i just felt that oh god i got emotional and i forgot to ask about my admission therefore i had thought that after i finish my speech i will go to swami and ask him swami give me admission but by now i had become so large hearted that when i went to swami i said swami so many are waiting to see you swami come to shri shailam <laughs> i prayed for the whole school automatically nothing no brownie points for me that is the magic of his love his love automatically makes us large hearted makes us broad minded in fact that is the way to know whether a person has been touched by swami's love or not any person touched by swami's love is large hearted and broad minded narrow minded selfish no but love has not it percolated within that's all very easy to make out and therefore and thus i returned back to my seat without having asked for that for which i had been preparing for 2 years all the competition that i had participated in one all the hard sweat blood and toil for this sake and that itself i didn't ask for swami but you know something when we ask for swami automatically everything gets conferred it happened so magically that a couple of days later swami blessed all of us with pada namaskar we were leaving the school was leaving back and swami agreed to give everybody pada namaskar so all of us would be seated in two rows you know rows and swami would walk in between the rows so as swami walks we can touch swami's feet and as swami was walking i had written a letter also that was my habit as i said every time i would write a letter and as swami came close i gave him the letter i bent down and kissed his feet and i thought eh why don't i ask swami now that thought came and as i was about to raise myself to ask swami swami puts his hand on my head and puts me down pushes me down so again i could not ask but then swami turns to me and says you spoke yesterday right i said yes swami and swami walked and went ahead i felt so happy wow swami could make out huh? how he remembered how he you know it was so fantastic we know swami is divine and yet when he shows his divinity we feel so thrilled but that was not all swami turned about swami was about 3 4 meters away when he stopped turned and said hey boy what are you going to do after 10th ah huh? 11th 12th then what you will do medical engineering what you will do i i thought these were the only two options so i said swami medical swami swami said take biosciences in my school and study well wow this is what it is once we ask for god everything that we need will automatically be given to us and if at all there is anything that is not given to us it's only because we don't need it and that was how in the june of 1998 i got admission in the shri satya sai higher secondary school at puttaparthi i finally became swami student swami is dunapota and yes so many stories so many beautiful things that happened but these were the foundational experiences 
very deep, very precious. As I said, these are facets that we possibly will not share in any structured speech. But this gave me the beautiful opportunity to travel down memory lane, dig out those feelings and those learnings. And I'm so grateful to Swami because by joining his school, we are all part of his school always because we keep getting schooled, we keep, we keep learning, we keep growing. It has changed my life forever and at this point in time in my life, when I look back, if I'm allowed to rewind my life and start all over again, crossing my heart, Swami knows I'm saying the truth. I would lead it exactly in the same way I have led this life. And that is the kind of regret free and celebratory uh, attitude that I have towards life all because of Swami. I'm so grateful to Swami for all the joys that he has given. I'm so grateful to Swami for all the sorrows that he has given because those sorrows are nothing but camoufla camouflaged joys. Those sorrows actually have given birth to much greater joys than I ever imagined. And therefore, I'm grateful to him for both joys and sorrows. And yes, I'm grateful to him also for this beautiful opportunity to uh, speak and share all this. I always conclude with the same prayer that is may our love for Swami keep growing stronger every passing moment. Thank you. Jai Sai Ram.